This simple sketch is the very first impression of a Saab car. It was drawn by Gunnar Jungström and shown to Sven Otterbeck, Saab's deputy managing director, in May 1945. It became the basis for the board's decision to start a trial production of passenger cars. During the war years, Saab was founded solely for the production of military aircraft. With peace in sight and the foreseen cutback in defense spending, the management saw the need for a complementary line of production. After much consideration, they decided it should be passenger cars. However, no one at Saab knew anything about the design and building of cars, with the exception of one young engineer. His name was Gunnar Jungström, who in the pre-war years had spent some time working in the British motor industry. The board at Saab thus thought he would be the best man in the organization to find out more about how to start making cars. A project team with Gunnar Jungström as manager was formed to get the project underway. The technical construction of a car was not the main problem. Rather, it was what the new car should look like. The team had a number of clay models with different shapes made up, but soon realized that they didn't know very much about car design. Jungström then turned to a former Saab employee, Sixten Sassen, now an industrial designer. During the 1930s, Sarsen had made a name for himself with his drawings of futuristic cars. And even aircraft. Here is his idea of a jet-propelled delta-winged fighter from 1941. Its similarity to the Saab 35 Draken that was to become a reality 14 years later is startling. Sarsen's interest in aircraft design most certainly influenced the aerodynamic shape of the first Saab car. Various models were made and rejected again and again until they finally came up with a design proposal that indicated what a future Saab car could look like. Or, well, it finally began at least to look like a Saab. The next step was to produce a 1 in 10 scale model in wood that could be tested in a wind tunnel. Once again, aviation know-how was put to good use. The X9248, which was the model's designation, had an extremely low wind resistance factor of 0 0.32. Now they had arrived at a shape with which all were happy. It had an attractive and distinctive appearance, the right size, and it clearly showed its heritage from the company's aircraft business. This heritage remains even in the cars bearing the Saab name today. The first drivable prototype was the so-called Ursaben, literally the original Saab. The body was hand-beaten by locally hired blacksmiths. Sheet steel for cars was something quite new to the aircraft workers, who normally worked with aircraft aluminium. Here we see the first prototype, designated 92001, leaving the assembly hall. At last, a drivable prototype could be proudly shown to a highly interested board of directors. The color was actually black, and not the green, later associated with the first production of Saab 92s. Since Saab's own engine and transmission were not yet ready, the first prototype was fitted with many borrowed parts. For example, the Ursaab's engine and gearbox came from a DKW. You can still see the familiar Auto Union four rings on the fuel tank. 
One of the first test drivers was naturally Gunnar Jungström himself. Here we see him rounding the hangars in the Saab factory compound in Linköping. Maximum mileage. The Ursaab was driven literally day and night for thousands of miles, many on the rough gravel roads common in Sweden in those days. The covered wheel arches, a novel feature on the prototype, were soon abandoned, as they also led to snow and mud clogging the space between the wheels and the wing panels, and thereby making it difficult to turn the front wheels in bends. Now they had a tested prototype. Manufacturing plans were in place and cost calculations were completed. They even had a Swedish distributor signed up. All that was needed now was the go-ahead from the board. This decision was taken at the board meeting on February the 27th, 1947, less than two years after the project was initiated. The prototype can still be seen today in the Saar Museum in Trollita, where it has been restored to its original drivable state. On special occasions, it can thus be taken out for a spin to the delight of the spectators. The U.S. market was from early on always important for Saab. When new U.S. regulations for crash worthiness were announced in the mid-1970s, it quickly became apparent that the current Saab 99 would have to be redesigned. Saab had for some time been considering a new model since the Saab 99 was approaching its tenth year. The new car was designated the Saab 900. The Saab 900 had a great deal in common with earlier Saab cars. Many of the body components were taken from the Saab 99 Combi Coupe hatchback, but it was 12 centimeters longer. This was needed to handle the new crash safety requirements. Like all previous Saabs, it was front wheel driven and had big 15 inch wheels for superior traction. But above all, it had world class active and passive safety, giving it its own distinctive identity. The Saab 900 came in both three and five door versions and could be ordered with all of Saab's engines, starting with the 100 horsepower with a single carburetor version and with the 145 horsepower direct fuel injected turbocharged version for the top of the line model. The four door Saab 900 sedan was premiered at the 1980 Geneva Motor Show. The Saab 900 CD was the designation for a stretched version. It was built at the Saab Valmet assembly plant in Finland, where several cars in the Saab range were made. Throughout the 1980s, Saab's engineers continued to be innovative. The H engine, with its completely new block, was launched in cars with a five-speed transmission, giving reduced fuel consumption with the same output as before. The second generation of turbo engines arrived with APC, APC standing for Automatic Performance Control. The patented APC system was able to adapt the engine to run safely without knocking on varying fuel qualities. Interior luxury was also a competitive factor, and for the first time real leather upholstery could be offered initially to Saab turbo buyers. Saab was first to offer asbestos free brakes, a strong environmental argument. Saab was also the first manufacturer to install as standard an air filter that blocked dust, pollen and even certain bacteria from entering the passenger compartment. In 1984, a new electronic ignition system without breaker points was introduced, 
and in the autumn, Saab launched its new 175 horsepower 2 litre turbo engine with double overhead camshafts and four valves per cylinder. The EMS and GLE versions were now replaced by a Saab 900i model. In the expanded range, you could get a Saab 900 as a 900i with direct fuel injection and eight valves, a 900 turbo with eight valves, and a 900 turbo with 16 valves. You could choose to have it with three, four, or five doors. The 900i was also available in a two-door version. In 1987, Saab gave the 900 lineup a so-called facelift. All models now had new bumpers front and rear. Even the grille was modified. Together, these changes reduced the drag coefficient by 5%. In 1988, ventilated brakes on the front wheels and the handbrake were modified to operate on the rear wheels. In the following year, the braking system was further improved when the ABS Plus 3 anti-locking system was available as an option on all Saab 900 models. An additional high-mounted brake light could be seen in the rear window to meet a new regulation. The wiper washers on the headlights now had a larger swept area. As of 1992, ABS brakes were standard equipment on all Saab 900s. When 1993 came around, it was time to end production of the original Saab 900. At that time, the Saab 900 could be had in three, four, and five-door body styles. Engines had outputs ranging from 128 to 175 horsepower, either normally aspirated with direct fuel injection or turbocharged, with the light pressure turbo 2 or 2.1 liter engines, and with all engines with four valves per cylinder. The first generation Saab 900 was manufactured from 1979 until 1993. With the arrival of 1986 came the production of the first Saab convertible. It was based on the two-door Saab 900 T16. The initial production in 1986 was intended first and foremost for the U.S. market. The enormous demand forced prospective customers to be waitlisted, and the entire planned production of 2,500 convertibles for the following year was sold even before production started. The Swedish market was only allocated a few hundred per year, and some of those that placed their orders in late 1986 had to wait until 1989 to enjoy driving topless. Full-scale production of the Saab convertible started in 1987 at the Saab Valmet plant in Usikapunki in Finland. The initial production rate of 12 cars a day, or a total of 2,500 cars that year, was clearly far too modest. The engine in the Saab convertible was the top-of-the-line, 175-horsepower, turbocharged, 2-litre power plants that had made the Saab Aero such a success. The fully automatic black soft top hood had three layers. As a safety measure, it could only be raised and folded down when the car was stationary, with the engine running and the handbrake applied. All side windows were electrically operated. The first impulse to add a convertible to the Saab lineup came from Bob Sinclair, president of Saab's US sales company. His first thought was that such a model would be great for the American market. He was wrong. It turned out to be a worldwide success. As a successor to the successful Saab 900 convertible, Saab's design chief Bjorn Ienval even came up with the idea that it could be done on the Saab 9000. This model shows that another handsome creation could have come from Saab's design center. However, it was not until the arrival of the second generation Saab 900 that the world was to see a new Saab convertible. One of the major goals for Saab was to create soft top cars that could be used in comfort all around the year, even in severe winter weather. The automatic air conditioner, the ACC, was designed to adapt its function according to whether the top was up or down. 
The problem in building a good convertible is torsional stiffness. All of Saab's convertibles are designed from the bottom up with reinforcing members to achieve this stiffness without adding much extra weight. From now on, a convertible version was included in the development program of every new model, except for the 9.5. When the new Saab 9.3 arrived in 1999, a convertible 9.3 came shortly afterwards. The latest Saab 9.3 convertible has just about everything you could desire. It looks great with the top up or down. You're entirely independent of the weather. Press a button and the top goes up or down. Today the Saab 9.3 convertible is available in three luxury grades. Linear, Vector and the top of the range Aero. All three models can be tailored to meet the particular demands of the customer with respect to accessories for lockable skis, bikes or surfboards. You can choose from turbo engines ranging from the 1.8 litre light pressure turbo with 150 horsepower to the 2 litre aero turbo developing 210 horsepower. Safety features include airbags, the SAHR head restraints, the Dyna cage, a system with a heavily reinforced frame around the windscreen, pop-up bars behind the head restraints in the rear seat to provide protection in case of a rollover. A convertible is always pleasing to the eye. But this must even be the case with the top in place. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Saab friends, Saab 9000, at last, unveiled, there she is in all her beauty. I've had the privilege to drive her when, uh, where we were not supposed to be discovered, and I will tell you immediately, she is marvelous. With these words, George Kansund, president of Saab Scania AB, opened a press conference at which the new Saab 9000 was launched in May 1984. Over a three-day period, motoring journalists from all over the world had been invited to test drive a pre-production series of this entirely new Saab car. But it all began six years earlier. Saab had already moved up market for larger cars, first with the Saab 99. With the introduction of the EMS and GLE as well as the Saab 900 range, Saab could offer increased performance and luxury. It was Saab's success in this respect that the idea of building an even larger and more exclusive car began to take shape. In the mid-1970s, Saab's design chief, Bjorn Ienval, outlined the concept for the new car. Up until then, Saab had done all its own design and development work. But in this particular endeavor, they decided to find a partner to share development costs. Lancia, in Italy, were also in the process of developing a new car, in the same size class as the planned Saab, and were thus an ideal partner. Giorgio Grigaro designed the basic form for both models. The main purpose was to share a similar basic platform while allowing both cars to retain their distinctive appearance and identity. The resulting Saab 9000 was somewhat of a contradiction in the Saab lineup. It was launched as a much larger car, even though its overall length was actually somewhat shorter than the 900. But inside you could see and feel the difference. In fact, in the USA it was rated a large car according to the national classification standards. 
Bjorn Ienval and his design team stuck to the now established Saab hatchback concept so successful with the 900 series. At the same time they worked hard on the interior. Various proposals were examined and discussed. The larger interior was made possible thanks to the longer wheelbase and increased track width, the transverse engine layout and front wheel drive. The engineers and designer even went down on the floor with full-scale drawings and full-size dummies to study the passenger compartment. The starting point for all calculations was the hip point. The car had to be comfortable for all sizes of passengers, for big and small drivers. Thanks to the larger tailgate that could be open to roof level, the large load area was easily accessible and the car could be loaded like a delivery van and yet had the smart exterior lines of a family estate car. Work on fully drivable prototypes got underway in 1981. Camouflaged cars were tested in varying climates ranging from the plus 40 degree heat of deserts to freezing minus 40 degrees along winter roads. All in all, the test drivers racked up 10 million kilometers around the world. Some of the test driving was carried out at the Myra testing facility in England. One of the test drivers was legendary rally ace Eric Carlson. factor in achieving low fuel consumption is the drag coefficient. After 300 hours of wind tunnel testing, Saab's engineers were able to come up with a car that had a wind resistance factor of 0.34, which was much the same as the extremely aerodynamically shaped Saab 92, with its factor of 0.32, but with the cross section of a much larger car. How many times can you press a button or turn on the direction blinkers. How long will the radiator system hold up? How much rubbing can the seating upholstery withstand? All these factors and many others were tested with robots and worked day and night for months. Did the headlights have sufficient capacity and range? The lighting equipment was tested under all conceivable driving conditions. The chassis, and thus the roadworthiness, has to be tuned so that the car behaves consistently and predictably, irrespective of its load, the road conditions, and the speed in question. One of the goals is to keep the car's center of gravity as low as possible. The low center of gravity gives the driver quicker information of how the car is behaving. For Saab, the goal was to give the car the highest level of sportiness without foregoing the demand for comfort. However sophisticated the test equipment is, nothing can replace the ability and experience of a skilled chassis engineer behind the wheel. In early 1981, the new Saab 9000 was previewed internally the Saab's international sales organization. The initial launched cars were powered by Saab's now renowned two-liter turbocharged engine. Now in its third generation, 
It featured four valves per cylinder, double overhead camshafts, and a turbo compressor fitted with an intercooler. The output was a respectable 175 horsepower. The pre-production run of 160 cars was built in early 1984, and it is now only months before the press preview. Journalists from Sweden and abroad are invited to see and test drive the car in May 1984. That the new Saab was a high-performance car was clear from the very start. And its reliability was proved on October the 7th, 1986, when three Saab 9000s crossed the finish line at the Talladega Raceway in Georgia, USA, having just set two new world speed records and 21 international records. The first international speed record for 10 kilometers from a standing start was set on day one of the 21-day non-stop endurance run. After only five minutes, with a speed of 202.798 kilometers per hour. Notable was the fact that the cars were entirely standard cars that had come straight from the production line in Trollida. This fantastic achievement resounded around the motoring world. In early 1986, an entry-level model was introduced with the 2-litre normally aspirated engine that had an output of 130 horsepower. It was called the Saab 9000i-16 and was well received by the press and car buyers alike. In 1988, the model range was further broadened with the addition of a classic four-door sedan called the Saab 9000 CD. It had the typical sedan separate luggage compartment and a fixed parcel shelf behind the fixed rear seat. Considerable body changes were introduced so that the crashworthiness was even greater than that of the Saab 9000. The Saab 9000 range was further developed with the arrival of the Saab 9000 CS with entirely new front and rear ends, an even larger tailgate and improved crash safety. Over the years the Saab 9000 range was constantly upgraded, especially with the best possible safety equipment, such as anti-lock brakes and double airbags. The range of engines was broadened to include a light pressure turbo, eco power, and in its later years, also Saab's new V6 3-liter engine developing 210 horsepower. The most powerful engine in the Saab 9000 was in the Aero model, with its 225 horsepower. When the car was launched, back in 1984, marketing vice president Bengt Erdmann closed the proceeding with these words. Ladies and gentlemen, a star is born. Already back in 1983, one year before the launch of the Saab 9000, Saab's design center began work on the next new Saab. The original plan was to base the new Saab on the same platform as the Saab 9000. However, when General Motors became part owner in 1990 of the newly formed Saab automobile, access to new platforms and components from GM's European arm Opel opened up new opportunities. Properly used, this meant considerable synergies in saving time and cost. Head designer Bjorn Ienval gave his colleagues George Wardle and Einar Hareda the assignment to design the exterior of the new Saab. The two designers each came up with their own full-scale models. Wardle's was a five-door hatchback and Hareda's a four-door sedan. Both incorporated Saab's classical wedge-shaped theme dating back to Sixten Sassen's and Yenval's eras as head of design. Great emphasis was placed on retaining typical Saab design signals. The two proposals were presented to the board together with two competing proposals, one from Pininfarina and one from the ASC. Together with the board, it was decided that Wardle's five-door proposal was the most Saabish one. 
further progress was now in a hurry, since the original plan from 1989 was that production should come underway in 1993. Three generations of prototypes for what was to become the new Saab 900 were to be built. And in May 1991, the first of these saw the light of day. Before road testing was started, sub-assemblies were tested in rigs. First as separate items, and then assembled in stages to form larger units, and finally as a complete car. The running prototypes were subjected to pure torture testing, from arctic cold, to searing desert heat. One of the most merciless tests is driving on cobblestone roads, often called Belgian Park in order to accelerate fatigue and wear on the body joints. The camouflaged cars were driven thousands of miles day and night. It's often on the smaller roads that the test drivers discover whether the prototypes can meet Saab standards. Road conditions change all the time. Weather, wind and road changes as well as varying driving conditions constantly offer new challenges. The latest in new production technology was used. High-tech robots welded the body with the highest possible precision. Along the assembly line, a completely new organizational approach was adopted. Teams were formed to create autonomous workstations. Experienced prototype builders were mixed with the less experienced and even complete newcomers. This ensured that the know-how of the prototype builders could be passed on to the others, thereby ensuring consistently high quality at every stage. When the new Saab 900 was launched, it came with four engine choices. The economy version, the 900 2.0 injection, had the 2.0-litre, 133-horsepower unit, while a 900 2.3 injection had the bigger 2.3-litre block, producing 150 horsepower. Up the scale was a 2.5-litre V6, producing 170 horsepower, and the turbocharged 2.0-litre, developing 185 horsepower a maximum torque of 263 Nm, already at 200 RPM. All models came as standard with a new 5-speed transmission, and there was a 4-speed automatic available as an option. Just like its predecessors, the new Saab 900 not only offered exceptional driving pleasure, it also offered exceptional load flexibility. The rear seat was divided 60-40, and could be folded down to extend the load area. When partly folded, Long objects could be stowed while still allowing two to be seated in the rear. When completely folded down, the load area had a capacity of 1,314 litres. The ignition key is once again on the console between the front seats. The dashboard was built up around logical groupings of the instrument and controls. All the switches and buttons are shaped and placed so that they can be operated without the driver needing to look down. The ridge at the lower edge of the panel acts as a reference point for experience.
example, when changing a CD in the players. Safety is ensured in every conceivable way. The driver's side airbag is standard, belt tensioners on the front seat belts, three-point seat belts for all rear passengers, submarining protection on the seats. The body incorporates a protective cage of high tensile steel, steel beams in the doors and impact absorbing padding on the inside, scientifically designed crumple zones front and rear. Saab didn't have a station wagon in its line. Nineteen ninety seven saw the arrival of a completely new Saab, the Saab nine five, a successor to the Saab nine thousand. Design work on the Saab 95 started in 1992 and was led by Ena Hareda, who now had succeeded Bjorn Ienval as head of the design center. Together with his colleague Tony Catignani, they created the basic shape for Project 640, which was the internal code for what was to become the Saab 95. The goal was to determine what future buyers were looking for. Feedback from the marketing department played an important role in determining the final design. The shape of the future Saab 95 had to be both bold and harmonious. So if boldness was to characterize the exterior, the interior should exude harmony. The driver should have a harmonious and calm environment to ensure full concentration of driving. To save time and cost, the initial wind tunnel testing was carried out with one to five scale models. Horkan Danielson and his team found that the ideal body shape should be round at the front and sharper angles at the rear. The final Saab 95 had a fairly round rear, but it included numerous smaller surfaces that served as what they called steering feathers. The construction of the body was led by Kent Bovalon. The goal was to design the safest car in its class. Here they could draw on experience from the Saab 9000 and Saab 900, already among the safest on the market, and which could now be further developed and incorporated in the new Saab 95. As usual, all components and sub-assemblies were tested in the laboratory to ensure they met the standards set forth by the project management. Three generations of prototypes were planned and built. Now testing of fully built-up cars could start. They started with winter testing in northern Sweden during the winter of 1994-95. In truly severe cold, they tested the interior climate system driver and passenger comfort, and the car's behavior on varying winter roads. The prototypes turned out not only to be the best looking prototypes ever built, but they also were of such a high quality that few faults were discovered. This enabled summer testing to be started at much the same time, and for this they went to Australia and the southwest of the USA. The cars were generally disguised to hide their identity. Durability testing was performed at various test tracks. The cars were driven in three shifts day after day during a period of 25 weeks in order to rack up the mileage normally run up in several years. This means particularly severe strain on the engine, the transmission, chassis and exhaust system. 
that even the interior, the controls, instruments and seats were subjected to maximum wear. It was soon clear that the forthcoming Saab 95 was a highly successful construction. The car was revealed for the general public at the 1997 motor show in Geneva and was given a warm reception by the world's motoring press. The Saab 95 was marketed in four distinctive versions. The base model, called Linear, with Equipment Level 1, Park, with Equipment Level 2, Vector, with Equipment Level 3, and finally the High Performance Aero model. All models could be personalized with choice of upholstery, various dashboards, leather-clad steering wheel, electrically adjusted seats, to mention just a few of the options. All engines were transversely mounted and all were turbocharged with an intercooler. Double head overhead camshafts, four valves per cylinder, double balance shafts and hydraulic engine mountings. The engine range for the Saab 95 also included a diesel alternative. The Saab 95 was awarded the highest rating of five stars in the European NCAP crash test. Once established on the Swedish market, the Volkswagen insurance company rated the Saab 95 as the safest car of all categories in 2005, based on the results of real-life studies on all cars on the road. This was a position once held by its predecessor, the Saab 9000. Saab didn't have a station wagon in its line since the days of the Saab 95. Certain leanings in this direction had existed during Bjorn Ienval's time as head of the design department, but were never realized. However, in the summer of 1998, a completely new station wagon based on the Saab 95 sedan was launched. As usual, the starting point for a new model begins with the interior demands. When the space for the driver and passengers, as well as the load area, have been decided, the designer can start finalizing the body shape. A full-scale clay model built on a steel chassis is then produced. The clay surface is scraped and polished to form a smooth shape. is then coated with a painted foil to achieve the best possible finish. Although many of the components in the Saab 95 wagon came from the 95 sedan, the wagon should be regarded as a completely new car. run through the same exhaustive testing program on test tracks and in various climate conditions. The Saab 95 wagon was designed to be a sporty estate car with a flexible load area. With the rear seats in place, it can hold all of 895 litres SAE. When the seats are folded down, the capacity is increased to a massive 2,000 litres SAE.
like the sedan version, the Saab 95 wagon is available in four equipment levels. Linear, Park, Vector and Aero. All models could be personalized with choice of upholstery, various dashboards, leather clad steering wheel, electrically adjusted seats, to mention just a few of the options. The Saab 95 wagon can be delivered with the same range of engines as the sedan models. Nineteen ninety nine was another year in which a new Saab model was brought to market, the Saab nine three. The Saab nine three brought with it much from the second generation Saab nine hundred, but was in many respects truly a new car. The first thing you noticed was the redesigned rear end. The registration plate had been moved up between the rear lights, giving the car a lower, sleeker look. The Saab nine three came in two body styles. A three-door coupe or a five-door hatchback. The standard equipment level came with the 93S, while the more lavishly equipped 93SE came with ACC, cruise control and info display, luxury velour upholstery, leather-clad steering wheel and 15-inch alloy wheels. In addition, the Saab 93 could be personalized with a wide range of optional accessories. When you're seated behind the wheel, you immediately become aware of Saab's aircraft heritage. All the instruments are logically organized. To the left, everything to do with lights. To the right, and in the central console, you find everything to do with driver information, the climate system, and in-car entertainment. Much of what is new cannot be seen from the outside. The new chassis construction offers vastly improved road performance and better communication between the road and driver via the seat. The car could be delivered with ACC, with which you merely set the desired temperature and then forget it. The ACC automatically made sure the temperature inside stays at the desired level summer or winter. In addition, a particle filter effectively removed dust, soot and pollen from the incoming air. Interior safety included active head restraints, driver's side airbag as standard and side airbags on both sides, load displacement protection and submarining protection that ensures safe seating both in the front and back. The new generation of turbocharged engines was called Saab EcoPower, since they produce additional pulling power even at engine speeds hardly above idle. The Saab 93 engine range included the fully turbocharged engines rated 185 and 200 horsepower respectively, a light pressure turbo engine developing 154 horsepower, a normally aspirated engine with 130 horsepower, and 115 horsepower turbocharged diesel. The Saab 93 had many similarities with the second generation Saab 900, but still differed in many ways. First and foremost, you discovered them on the road. The Saab 93 quickly became a highly popular member of the Saab family around the world appreciated for its road performance and high quality. It was in production for just four years. It was then time for the new Saab 93 Sport Sedan to be launched. Saab's aircraft heritage is clearly evident in the new Saab 93 Sport Sedan. You immediately get the feeling of being in a cockpit. Controls and instruments are grouped in a logical manner and within easy reach. Then being able to orient yourself geographically on the dashboard display can only contribute to this feeling. 
development, the model makers began to shape the future exterior design. They set themselves a high goal. The low drag coefficient was a must for the new car's performance and operating economy. Scale models were wind tunnel tested until the right drag coefficient was reached. Combining a rounded rear section with a low drag coefficient is a hard task. Saab's aerodynamic engineers succeeded in achieving course stability already with the Saab 95 models. Various full-scale design studies were produced. So-called clinics were organized at which selected viewers were invited to express their opinions about the different design studies. basis of this input, further work was done on refining the ultimate shape with new clay models. Each new clay model is subjected to a wind tunnel test. When everyone is happy with the scale model figures, a full-scale plastic model is built for further wind tunnel testing.
Saab 93 Sport Combi is a car that is designed to meet the demands of those customers who are looking for the flexibility of an estate with its larger load capacity, but don't want to sacrifice driving pleasure. Saab's aerodynamic engineers have again succeeded in eliminating all lifting forces front and rear, and thereby achieving exceptional high-speed stability as well as an extremely low drag coefficient of 0 0.33. Not bad for an estate car. The low drag figure also helps to keep fuel consumption down. The loading capacity with the seats in place is 419 litres. Fold down the rear seats and it becomes all of 1,273 litres. The floor of the luggage compartment can be opened up and locked in place to create extra space for big shopping bags from the supermarket. The 93 Sport Combi comes with the same engine choices as the sedan models. For a start, there are the four-cylinder petrol engines with and without turbocharging, two 1.9-litre diesel engines producing 120 and 150 horsepower are also available to Sport Combi customers. The most exciting engine alternative is, of course, the new V6, with its 250 horsepower that comes in the aero model and offers performance of the highest level. The rigid body structure is the key to the car's excellent road holding, crashworthiness and low noise level. Despite its longer roof and larger tailgate opening, the torsional stiffness of the Sport Combi is only marginally lower than that of the 93 Sport Sedan. As you can see, the Saab 93 Sport Combi is not just your ordinary estate car. It is a car with a very special character of its own in the true Saab spirit. In 1959, a group of technicians under the direction of Rolf Melder wanted to explore and check how much power and torque could a front-wheel drive car cope with with the limited tire technology they had at that time. The answer in the development process was a Saab 93 Monster and it's called the Monster for obvious reasons. The car has two engines, two Saab 93 GT 750 engines combined to a straight six-cylinder engine, a six-cylinder two-stroke engine delivering around 140 to 145 horsepower. Uh, everything is mounted in a very very light Saab 93 body, lined with a lot of holes, aluminum doors and fiberglass parts and the car weighs just 680 kilos and this gives extraordinary power to weight ratio. Uh, we use a standard transmission in the car and a drive shaft but the transfer mounted engine is combined with a very very interesting gear warm design that is transferring the power into the longitudinal transmission. This car was used for testing and for top speed driving with the drivers Carl Magnus Skog and Harry Carlson and they reached officially 196 km per hour with this car. Unofficially we can say it was 223. This was an extremely rapid car, never intended for serial production, but it has left a very, very good mark of the Saab history in the museum's collection. And well, was it official reason to check the car with a torque ability? I don't know. I think this was an excellent opportunity to check the limits with the engineer and the ingenious sub thinking with the help of Rolf Melde and his engineers.